So hi, everybody, and welcome to this conference hosted by the MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined today by Dr. Susan Hayrovi, who will be talking to us about food and fasting for MS and when should you eat and what should you eat. After her presentation, we'll open it up to your questions and answers, or comments rather. So now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Susan Hayrovi is a physician practicing integrative and functional medicine at Stanford, treating patients with complex chronic disease, including autoimmunity. She also lives with MS, which is interesting, right? She experienced her first symptoms shortly after the birth of her first child. As a result, she could no longer practice anesthesia, anesthesia in an attempt to find out what else she could do um, to improve her health, she came across an integrative medicine conference, which changed everything. She now works with patients to improve their health using lifestyle therapies and the safe use of natural supplements and herbs in tandem with Western medicine therapies. To share what she's learned with the MS community, she created True Medicine, an online wellness program specifically for those living with MS, to share what she found to be transformative in improving their own health, her own health. Dr. Susan lives in the South, um, San Francisco Bay Area on a tiny organic family farm and her husband, three boys, ages 12, 10, and seven, and hives with over 50,000 bees. We're pleased to have her join us to present this super important topic. Dr. Peyrovi, so happy that you're here with us today and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for the nice introduction. And I'm so excited to be here and to talk to everyone about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. It was not, uh, if it was not for MS, I would not have learned any of this information because I was a doctor practicing anesthesia when I got diagnosed. And so the diagnosis set me off on a journey of searching for what could help me make sure that I can be as healthy as possible in the future. And how do I go about putting it all into practice? Well, that was all kind of a black box to me when I first started and because it's not what we learn in medical school. And so began my journey and I went from studying one thing to another and from integrative medicine to functional medicine to mind body medicine to acupuncture and Chinese medicine and all of these different viewpoints help me formulate a really broad lens so that when I have a patient sitting in front of me, I can sometimes apply my Western medicine lens and think about pharmaceuticals, or I can apply my functional medicine lens and think about biochemistry and how we can improve this patient's cellular health. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just to put a couple of needles in and get somebody's anxiety to come down or their pain to improve. So I value all of these tools um, and I think they are all complementary and all really important and they are not in conflict with each other. I just think sometimes you need a different tool. And so some of the most powerful tools I have discovered are the lifestyle habits, like how we eat and sleep, rest, um, move our bodies, because in, this is how you truly start putting your cellular health back together. We don't have pharmaceuticals to do that. And um, unfortunately, I think in, in the realm of Western medicine, we think of these therapies as soft medicine. I Maybe I agree. It's soft medicine because we're not using potent um, tools to manage disease, but these are powerful medicines. And so today I want to talk to you about my perspective on food and how and when we should eat and how that can help and influence MS. So with that, I'm gonna start my screen share. Okay, so let's see, here we go. Okay, so food and fasting for MS. When, what should you eat and when should you eat? So we're gonna go in detail about talking about some of the best foods, some of the foods to avoid, as well as the basics of fasting and how to figure out what fasting regimen makes sense for you. So there are a lot of diets out there 
that can help MS. So for example, paleo diets is where you eat maybe more like your ancestors, where you're not eating a lot of refined grains, but maybe you're eating nuts and seeds and um, you know other foods that are unprocessed. Usually this is a low, low carb diet. There's the Walls diet, who's very similar to a paleo diet. She has you eating tons of colorful vegetables and um, organ meats even. And again, this is a low carb diet that's plant-based. There's the swank diet that um, is low in fat and also um, plant-based. And I think in the first year, you actually don't even get to do a lot of animal products. Then um, there's the McDougal diet. And this is a diet that's essentially vegan. You're eating a lot of grains and other plant-based foods. And this has also been demonstrated to help MS. Ketogenic diets have been um, also found useful. These are low carb, moderate protein, and that's key, moderate protein, not high protein, um, but high fat diets. And you, hopefully you're focusing on plant-based fats. But so these have also shown, been shown to improve neurodegenerative diseases, including MS. There was a recent article out that the more people adhered to a Mediterranean diet, the lower their symptom scores and some objective um, um, investigations into some of their symptoms. And a Mediterranean diet is basically a plant-based diet and it varies from region to region in the Mediterranean. Maybe we should all be vegetarian if we have MS or maybe even take it further and become vegan, right? And I do have patients who say, I'm really trying to be vegan because that's the best diet for MS. And I have to just stop and say, why do you think that's the best diet, right? Because all of these diets can be very useful, um, but we have to dig in and figure out what's what. So the devil's in the details, right? So whenever you're evaluating a diet, I want you to ask yourself certain questions. And I'm never going to give you a list of 20 best foods for MS because there are no 20 best foods for MS. There are 500 or a thousand best foods for MS, you know, so natural plant-based foods. Um, so today I'm not going to give you lists. I'm going to give you broad general um, guidelines that I want you to operate under. So when you're looking at any of the food plans, what foods are they including? And what foods are they excluding? What are the quality of the foods? Um, are you allowed to eat processed foods? How about the quality of the, the actual fruit or vegetable? Is it fresh? Is it local? How was it grown? Um, is there the diet that you're evaluating? Is there diversity in that diet? Does, and that means, are you eating a lot of different ingredients over the course of seven days? Um, for example, if you can get to 50, like that's a great place to start. Is there color? Um, these, I think, are all really important points, including the um, inclusion of fermented foods that help support our microbiome. So these six points can sort of encapsulate what a good diet should include and exclude. And I think we need to always think about color and how we're supporting the microbiome. So why is there so much confusion? Well, it's hard to know what's real food because our food system has changed so much. With mass agriculture, we've had to resort to raising food in very different ways. We keep planting food in the same soil and the soil loses its nutrients. And that means maybe our food is um, deficient in nutrients. And because we want to have convenience, we produce processed packaged foods that last forever. Um, but you have to do something to that food to be able to survive, you know, months and months, if not years. So when you go to a grocery store, your average grocery store, I would argue that maybe more than 90% of it is not real food, even though you think you're at the grocery store. Here you are about to pick up food for the week, you're going to go cook for yourself. But the line between real and artificial foods has become very blurred. Um, so for example, um, you can have plant-based milks. We think that they may be a healthier alternative for people who don't wanna do dairy. But if you look at the label, there's a lot of ingredients in there. So that's very different than you know 
soy milk from made from scratch. But I also want to be realistic and say, like, we're not all going to go home and squeeze our own almond milk and, you know, make everything from scratch. So it's about finding balance and picking and choosing wisely what you're going to allow in your home that's processed and what you're not going to allow. We are marketed to, to think certain things are health, healthy. Um, we are marketed to by physicians who tell us this is the right diet. And, you know, I was listening to something on gut health um, the other day, and they wanted you to exclude like just about every food group. And I thought, well, what's left to eat, right? So I think we have to have a balanced approach and a methodical way of thinking about what foods are we going to include and what we're going to exclude for ourselves. So marketing is very tricky. And, you know, just, you know, watch, watch a commercial and look at how they try to sell you a processed food by calling it natural or healthy. And then nutrition research is really, really confusing. There's not a lot of motivation to fund these um, projects because there's, you know, it's not patentable. You're not going to be able to sell, you know, something at the end. So, so there is that, like, there's not a financial incentive to do really big studies. The other issue is like, think about yourself. How often can you, or how long can you stay on a diet yourself? When somebody says, I want you to eat this diet. I think if you're really motivated, maybe like three days, it's, I consider myself, you know, a person who's very regimented that I, I don't even think I can get to three days. And even if we were to give everybody the same diet, you know, the, the amount of nutrients in two different apples differs and people have different ways of digesting their food. And there's so many other factors that influence digestion um, and absorption of food. So it's all confusing, but I want to give you broad categories to think about what are the best foods for MS. So anytime you're looking at, your, at any diet, you're going to look at, is it a whole foods diet, meaning the foods that are included are unprocessed and unpackaged. Some of the diets I mentioned earlier allow you to have tortillas. Well, you can go get a very processed tortilla that doesn't make it healthy and it could be non-organic. So it could be full of pesticides. So think about, is this food pretty close to how it grew in nature? And the best place you're going to find these foods is at a farmer's market or around the perimeter of your grocery store. And then I want you to think about eating mostly plants. And by mostly, how about we try to hit 80% or more of our diet to be plant-based? That doesn't mean you have to become a vegetarian or a vegan, but I do want you to start seeking out more and more plant-based foods. And we'll go into greater depth about what that means. And by 80%, I want you to gauge the real estate on your plate. What percent of your plate is covered with plant-based foods versus animal products? Let's talk about the worst foods for MS. Again, I'm going to give you broad categories. Artificial processed foods. If it comes in a package, if it has an ingredient label, if it can survive you know, months and months, it's probably processed. Humans had to do something to it to make it be able to last a long time. Too many animal products is also another problem because the fat profile in a lot of animal products, with the exception of fish and seafood, is that there's too much omega-6 and not enough omega-3. So eating a lot of animal products actually can inflame you and move your biochemistry towards biochemical, towards inflammatory pathways. The other thing to think about with animal products, and this is not something that's on most people's radar, is that animal products have a lot of toxins in them because these animals live in our environment and they get passive exposures from just what's floating around in the air and water, but they also may be given um, things that are not natural, like hormones and um, other things that they're exposed to. So another reason to minimize animal products, um, plant-based foods are not toxin-free, but they sure do have less toxins in them. So they're a better choice. We're not going for perfection. We're going for better sugar and also artificial sweeteners are also bad for MS because of the way they hijack your 
brain and your taste buds. And um, they make you actually seek out more sugary processed foods. When you have a lot of sugar in your diet, you're not looking for broccoli. You're looking for more sugar. And um, it's a stress to your hormone system because you have to keep secreting insulin and cortisol to deal with all that sugar. So it doesn't help to have a lot of sugar. And we're finding more and more information about artificial sweeteners that over long-term use, they can actually worsen blood sugar outcomes. They can um, change some hormones in humans like thyroid, for example, they can lead to allergic reactions. So they're just best to be avoided. And I always say, if you need to have a sugar, I'd rather you have like real cane sugar or honey or something else that's a less problematic sugar than an artificial one. So always go for the real, the natural food. And also the worst foods for MS are those treated with pesticides and herbicides. So in conventional farming, we use a lot of these um, chemicals to help make sure that the crops survive until we can harvest them. Unfortunately, a lot of these chemicals are neurotoxins and none of us with MS need more insults to our nervous system. So it's best to avoid them. You're never gonna get to a 100% organic um, diet, but it's worth being mindful and choosing organic when it makes sense. So what should you eat? Okay, so I gave you what, you, what are good and bad foods, but let's look at a plate. So visually 20% or less, is comprised of animal products and animal products are um, beef, fish, chicken, pork, shellfish, eggs, and dairy as well. And then the remainder of your plate should be plants and plants aren't just vegetables. They are also fruits. Don't forget about nuts and seeds, um, beans and legumes, um, whole grains, herbs and spices, like if you can start getting a lot of these foods into your diet, you are very quickly going to shift what's happening at the biochemical cellular level. It's actually very dynamic. When we eat within a few hours, we start turning on different pathways and turning on different genes. So it's a nice visual to have that every time you make a choice of what to eat, that you are going to influence your body at that cellular level that makes me feel very ho hopeful and it helps me personally make better choices when I'm faced with what to eat. Okay, so what else should we consider when it comes to food? Well, fermented foods, I think, are often overlooked. We know that the gut microbiome, which is the collection of the good microorganisms that live in our large intestine actually play such an important role in disease and in health and MS is no different. When our my gut microbiome goes out of balance, maybe because we um, used antibiotics, um, not that I'm not saying you shouldn't use antibiotics, but I'm just saying what the downstream consequences are. Um, maybe due to stress or a lot of artificial foods coming in or lack of sleep, the um, my gut microbiome can go out of balance and they can now no longer do so many of the functions that we as humans can't do for ourselves. We actually depend on the health of the gut microbiome to improve our own immune health. So the gut microbiome constantly is sending signals to the immune system. It is um, processing vitamins and producing neurotransmitters that are important in mood, like anxiety and depression. So getting more fermented foods in our diet is really important. And unfortunately, it's not a part of the American diet. So it's something that's new and is going to require a little bit of like you know, what can I do to just bring one fermented food into my home and start gaining, you know, a, a taste for it and to retraining my taste buds. And there's a little more detail here that we could go into. So fermented foods are called probiotic foods. There are also prebiotics. These are just the fibrous foods we eat in our um, plant-based diets. Many of these fibers are prebiotic fibers. So they feed our good bacteria. So it helps them grow and thrive. So if you're eating a plant-based diet and you're getting fiber in, you're probably getting your prebiotics in as well. I want you to think about organic, not because it's perfect. It's not perfect at all, but it is better than eating food that is intentionally 
um, sprayed with um, toxic uh, pesticides and herbicides. As I mentioned, many of them can be damaging, not just to our immune health, but also to our mitochondria, like the parts of our cell that produce energy that play such a key role in MS. You know, Dr. Walls talks about the, the, the health of the mitochondria all the time. And she's right. There's so much benefit to making sure these mitochondria work well. So one way to start improving the health of our mitochondria is to eat, eat less toxins. And one way to do that is by organic food. Non-genetically modified food is also important, but it's sometimes really hard to tell if a food is actually non-GMO. This is food that's been altered at the genetic level so that it can have a property like it can become resistant to herbicides that you may spray on it. So then you go into your farm and you start spraying your farm and everything will die, but the genetically modified plants. Um, so if you think you haven't had non-GMO foods, unfortunately, I'm here to tell you, you have, and you probably are getting exposed to them every day, unless you're being super careful. Um, most of the soy, corn um, in this country is genetically modified, alfalfa, and maybe you don't eat alfalfa, but maybe animals that you eat ate genetically modified alfalfa um, can get you exposed to them as well. So it's just important to start reading labels and being more mindful. I want you to think about getting food that's local, that you know didn't have to travel half a continent to get to you. Um, and also, you know, when foods grow in your natural area and they don't have to travel very far, you get to them sooner. So they have more alive nutrients in them. And sometimes when foods have to be imported from another country or from another state, they can get sprayed, even if they're organic. So uh, just choosing local food um, is really important. This may not be an option for everybody. There are some not so affordable options of getting organic food like shipped over to you if you know you live in an area where it's not available but i think it's worth trying and also supporting our local organic farmers who are taking really good care of the environment and the soil and also choosing foods that are in season if i can't buy tomatoes unless they're from mexico or another country um, you know, I just skip it. It's okay. There's other foods we could be eating and it's probably good for us to venture out and find new foods. Okay. So then I did mention the importance of eating color and I do want you to eat the rainbow every day, but uh, my kids always joke and say, well, we want to eat that rainbow. And I'm like, that's not the rainbow I'm talking about. I actually want you to eat this rainbow and just think about how you feel when I flash this picture on, doesn't this sort of wake up your senses and you can almost like maybe smell it and um, sort of invigorates you, right? Like if we can start connecting more to our foods, I think it'll make it easier to start looking for healthier foods. And so every day, if you can go through the rainbow and get every color, that is going to flood you with antioxidants anti-inflammatory molecules, uh, and lots of other nutrients um, like uh, vitamins and minerals. So one of the benefits of a plant-based diet is that it's, it's so high in vitamins and minerals. It's really the fastest way to get nutrients in yourself. So you don't have to eat giant amounts of each color, right? I want you to just eat small amounts of every color. And maybe just think to yourself right now, what colors do you do a great job of? What are the colors you're eating most days? I'd say most people do good with red and they do good with green. The one they really struggle with is purple. So the next time you're at the store, go look for purple and buy what's purple. So I like to talk about nutrition in a very visual way, because I think that's how we as humans think about food, right? I don't do serving sizes, like that doesn't interest me. I don't even know what serving sizes are, because I just eat what feels normal. When you eat natural foods, you don't have to worry about overeating. Okay, so let's talk about the GI tract, which is one of my favorite systems, because it's so remarkable. And it's something we all um, interface with at least two, three times a day when we're eating and we're, we're visiting the bathroom. So the gut has um, functions of digestion, breaking down food, absorption, which is 
um, pulling those nutrients into the body and then elimination out the other end. And hopefully elimination is happening one to two times a day. Um, and then there's, but there's other functions that the GI tract has. And these are the repair and restoration and renewal of the cells that line this giant um, system that is our GI tract. So imagine if you're eating all the time, your GI tract's going to be constantly engaged with digesting, absorbing, and eliminating. And there's really not an opportunity for repair and cleaning things out and restoring things, right? So I want you to start thinking about are, when are, when are there empty periods in my stomach where my you know where my gut can start doing this good work? So let's think about giving our GI tracts a break, right? Um, and I love this picture of the baby. It makes me happy when I look at it. So the GI tract needs and likes empty periods. Um, and how do we create that? by a fast. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean by a fast. Um, but it's not until you've emptied out a little bit where you can start repairing and cleaning up. So fasting is actually an ancient, ancient tool that has been used over centuries by many different societies. And it's actually a, a, a very powerful health promoting um tool that is very accessible, actually. And one thing to consider when you're looking at different fasting regimens is that different fasts may or may not involve calorie restriction. Um, so not all fasts require you to cut your calories down by a whole bunch. Okay. So I'm going to take you through a couple of different types of fasts and maybe talk to you about how you can implement them. Okay. Um, but let's, before I do that, let's talk about how fasting can help MS. If we can give a little empty periods to the, to the GI tract, what can that do for us? Well, you know, we know with MS, the immune system has become more dysregulated. It's not that we have like super, um, strong immune systems. Our immune system has just sort of forgotten the rules and, um, we, you know, instead of attacking foreign things, our immune system now attacks our own tissues or maybe even foods that we're eating. So when we fast, we actually bring more regulation to the immune system. It starts remembering the rules a little bit better and there's less attacking going on. And that means less inflammation. Um, autophagy happens. The word autophagy is broken down to auto, which is self and phagy, which is eating. So autophagy is this process when we've gone into a fasting period that um, our, our body starts pulling out older, more dysfunctional cells and replacing them with healthier, younger cells. And this is a, a really great way to start fixing things at the cellular level. You just get healthier cells um, in play. And again, part of that is, you know, new stem cells are regenerated, cellular aging slows down, which just basically means you have healthier cellular health. Um, antioxidant genes are turned on. And the word antioxidant, every time you hear that, think of it as um, antioxidants sort of surround maybe a cell and protect it. They are there for protection. And interestingly enough, um, we produce some of our own antioxidants, but um, most of the antioxidants we get are through plants. When we consume a plant, we get a lot of those good molecules in us, but the plant actually made those antioxidant molecules for itself, for its own protection. But when we consume those molecules, we get cellular protection. So just by fasting, that sends information into your DNA to turn on the antioxidant genes and make more antioxidants. And blood sugar improves. There are some amazing studies that show people that have been insulin dependent for 20 years after a very closely supervised medical fast, within a few months, they can come off of insulin, which is kind of shocking, but it's, it's true. So, um, and I have some words to share with you about if you have blood sugar issues before you jump into a fast. So I'll make sure we get to that as well. Um, also, you know, I put this last point in here um, because 
I think it's important to think about, you know, MS in the context of other health issues that can happen. I sort of at some on some level believe that I've met my quota of chronic diseases and like I have MS so like I can't get anything else but we know that that's actually not true right we um can still get cancers and other um dis- chronic illnesses so why it matters that fasting improves DNA repair and um suppresses tumors is that it reduces our risk of cancers as well So for all, and these are just some of the uh, reasons why fasting is a useful tool. I've put a great article down here. If you want to like get into the molecular aspects of it, it's really fascinating. Um, And, but before we start safety first, uh, you know, we're supposed to do no harm first. So you're always going to ease into a fast don't, don't be a hero. Don't try to go all of a sudden into a 24 hour fast. It will not be a good experience and you'll never want to do it again. So always be, um, start slow and small and we build on that. And as with anything, not just with fasting, whether it's whether exercise or met my, uh, meditation, always just start slow and slowly build on it. Never do anything extreme always drink water just throughout the day. Be mindful of that. Hopefully you're visiting the restroom to, to urinate every two to three hours when you're awake. Um, and then consult your doctor, especially if you have unstable blood sugars or low blood sugars, you have diabetes or pre-diabetes, or you're on blood sugar lowering medications and supplements. So if there are any blood sugar issues, please don't fast. Talk to your doctor first and say, uh, you know, what would be safe for me to do? And I'm going to give you some concrete things you can take to your doctor and ask them what, what they feel comfortable with. This is my first slide on fasting. I'm going to share three with you, three different types of fasts. Time-restricted feeding is actually my favorite way of fasting because it's like low barrier to entry. Um, This is also known as overnight fasting. Some people call this intermittent fasting, which is not exactly the correct term, but this does not require you to restrict calories. You can start with a fast between dinner and breakfast. And maybe you can think to yourself right now, when do I usually stop eating? And when do I have breakfast and calculate how many hours that is? So if you start with 10 to 12 hours, um, you, you may already be doing 10 to 12 hours. So if you know you're doing that well, that's a good starting point. And then from there, you can slowly build on it. The key to doing this is not to eat chocolate cake at 10 o'clock at night and then do the 10 to 12 hours after. The key is an early dinner. Hopefully you eat three hours before bed. So you have a nice empty stomach when you go to bed. Hopefully you're even a little hungry when you go to bed. Now you've set yourself up for your gut to start healing and for memory to improve and for brain health to improve. So this is actually a great regimen. So you're going to do an early dinner. And then if you need to, you'll delay breakfast by a little bit. So let's say you're good at doing 12 hours. Maybe you could start going to 13 hours and see how that goes. Um, Some people need a little warm drink in the morning, like, you know, a tea or coffee. Just don't put a bunch of sugar and cream in there. That's okay. If that helps you kind of get through the early part of your morning. I'm not like a stickler on perfection here. And as I said, always drink water. And then um, people get good at this over time. They uh, start lengthening it. And for me, I've gone to 16 hours. Yeah, I generally like to be at 15 hours uh, most days. You know, I don't like try to push myself to do 20 hours, you know, like some people do. 20 hours of fasting isn't that much better than 12 or 14 hours. It's marginally better. So um, just listen to your body and make sure that it's safe. Um, I'm going to talk to you about fasting mimicking diets. We actually have some data on MS with this fast. This one does require calorie restriction. This is where you, in what you pick a month, and you pick five consecutive days where you cut your calories down to half of what you normally consume. So 800 to 1,000 calories, five days in a row. The rest of the month, you're good. You just eat your normal healthy diet, no calorie restriction. And you aim to do three to six cycles of this. You don't even have to do this every month, okay? Um, This seems to have long-term benefits for cellular health and longevity. This is pretty doable. Most people can do this. And some of the data actually shows that um, 
you know, it, it, this, this one was actually, I think, interesting. They did a three-day fasting mimicking diet with mice and um, these mice had MS. So it showed that they had less autoimmunity, less demyelination and improved symptoms. And they started secreting um, some of the more anti-inflammatory cytokines and more of the favorable immune cells were showing up. Okay, so I think this speaks to uh, the power of a fast to really impact us at the cellular level. Um, and, you know, it doesn't stop there. Uh, the, this diet has been shown to uh, help with weight loss, lower cholesterol, balance blood sugars. Um, and uh, the person, one of the people who does a lot of research in this area is Walter Longo, and he uses this, I believe, and he's trying to live to 120. So we shall see. And then the third fast I'm going to talk to you about is intermittent fasting. Um, so the benefits of it are that they reduce inflammation. Um, this fast can help reduce oxidative stress. This is stressful, um, dangerous molecules that can bounce around at the cellular level, damaging cells and proteins. Um, intermittent fasting can also result in weight loss. Um, there can also be improved insulin sensitivity. So your insulin just works better, which means blood sugar works better. Even though you may have MS and not diabetes, good tight sugar control is really important for MS because when that falls apart, your systems have to work faster and that puts a big stress on the system and it leads to more inflammation. Um, intermittent fasting has been shown to improve blood pressure and um, improve gut motility. And there's lots of different ways of doing it. I'm going to talk to you about two different ways of doing it. There's, sorry, alternate day fasting where you're one day on one day off. So you eat 24 hours normally, and then you don't eat for 24 hours. This this can be a little tough to do. Um, and I don't like a lot of 24 hour fasts because I think that this is not where um, a beginner starts. I think beginners do well at that first one that I talked about the overnight fast between dinner and breakfast. But um, there's also the five, two plan, which I think um, is easier than the alternate day fasting. You pick any five days of the week and you eat your normal diet with no calorie restriction. And then you, and then the other two days, and they don't have to be um, next to each other. You do a fast um, those two days. So it could either be a 24 hour fast, or you can cut your calories down to about five or 600 on those two days. And it could be any two days and you can kind of mix and match. Okay. Um, and there was a study that showed they took mice and, and had them do intermittent fasting. Then they took their microbiome and transplanted it into mice that had MS. And it showed, and these mice showed um, slower ons onset and uh, progression of MS. And they've also done uh, the same people looked at um, uh, people with MS who started doing in intermittent fasting, and they saw similar changes and similar shifts in the gut microbiome. So one of the um, main reasons why we think fasting works is because it modulates the gut microbiome. And um, there was another study that showed um, uh, improvement in self-reported well-being and depression scores. Um, they took people uh, and for over eight weeks and ha had them do two different things. They either restricted their calories every day by about 20% every day, or they said, you only have to restrict your calories two days a week by 75%. And both these groups showed significant improvement in mood. Okay, so what is the best diet for MS? We're gonna do a quick review here. I want you to think about whole foods that are unprocessed, unpackaged, mostly plants, at least 80%. So look at this picture to the right. I would say this is pretty close to being 20% salmon and maybe 80% other plant-based foods and a lot of color there. Um, low in sugar. So, you know, skipping the artificial stuff um, and getting your taste buds to appreciate the taste of natural foods. Fermented foods, a little bit, a spoon or two every day. Get it, Next time you're at the store, go to the refrigerator section and look for what probio, um, ferment probiotic foods they have. And just grab a couple, stick it right in the front of your fridge so that you'll see it. And then you put it as like a little side dish to your meals. We love to put them on our healthy tacos. I have it with um, salads. I mean, there's really no limit to how you can use them. 
We're going to choose organic um, as much as possible, as well as non-GMO. And we're going to pick local and um, in-season food. And when's the best time to eat? Well, you're going to have to figure out which um, fast sounds like a good fit for you. But the goal is to go to bed with an empty stomach. So you want to stop eating three hours before bed. Then you want to aim for a window of 10 to 12 hours at least of overnight fasting. So it's really great to have that empty period because there's a lot of um, sleep physiology that comes on at night. But if you just stuffed some food down right before you went to bed, your GI tract's like, okay, now I got to deal with this thing that came in rather than tending to those things that help heal our bodies. I want you to think about eating two to three solid meals a day. During the pandemic, we just went down to two meals because I just could not prepare three meals a day from scratch for my family. And so we started doing a late breakfast and a, an early dinner. And it's interesting that even really young kids can eat that way and, and feel satisfied. Um, I make sure they're healthy and um, there's not a lot of snacking because every time you introduce food, now you have to deal with the digestion of it. So you want to just really limit that to two or three periods throughout the day where you're loading up your GI tract with food. Um, avoiding snacking. And um, one way to do that is to just not buy them. But if you do like to snack, or some people just need to eat all day long, we're all different. Having healthy vegetables like sugar snap peas, carrots, cauliflower, cherry tomatoes, you know, these things can be really easy to snack on nuts and seeds. Um, okay, so I want to end with this because I think it's a good visual for anybody with a chronic disease, really, especially if the immune system's involved. You know, our bodies are not like black and white. There's a lot of gray and there's a lot of back and forth between being in a very healthy state and being very close to um, a more diseased state. And autoimmunity is not an on-off switch. Either you have autoimmunity or you don't. I think of it as gradations of autoimmunity. So you can have a very well-regulated immune system right here on the left, where the immune system is nice and cool. It's following the rules. It's attacking foreign things and leaving our own um, tissues and our food alone. That's how the immune system is supposed to function. We call that tolerance. Or certain things can happen. Information from the environment can get into our bodies. And that information could be how we're eating, sleeping, managing stress, um, or moving our bodies or infections or trauma, or whatever it might be in the environment that can start dialing us closer to this more dysregulated state where the immune system kind of gets stuck in inflammation mode. And it's not getting the signal to turn things off again. And we can move back and forth on the spectrum based on whether or not we're using our medications or are we engaging in cleaner lifestyle habits? Are we making sure that we're, um, uh, you know, surrounded by things that are joyful, uh, that make us happy, that makes us laugh, makes us laugh and help us engage in positive emotions and thoughts. So I want you to have this picture in mind and think about all of the things that can help you move back towards a more regulated, regulated state. You know, MS is not curable, but I use the word heal sometimes, and I know it hits people the wrong way. And I want to just explain that there is healing that we can do, even in the worst of circumstances. As an end-of-life doctor, I have seen this in the last days of life where something happens and all of all of a sudden somebody's spiritual pain improves, or we, you know, uh, they make up with a long-lost relative and their mood or anxiety improves. And to me, that's a way of healing our bodies. We're not ever going to get rid of our MS diagnoses, but I think we can move towards a healthier state when we put into practice things that help us. Um, okay. So I believe that is my last slide. So thank you for being here. And I appreciate your time and attention and for just wanting to learn. It's so important. And, you know, MS is a big disease. Um, and we all have to do a little bit of learning and then a lot of implementing to start getting into that healthier state. Wow, thank you so much. That was, I'm, I'm ready to do it tomorrow. I'm starting, I might even start it tonight. 
I might start it tonight. You so, can't start it tonight. Eat an early dinner. I don't know what time you all are I'm, on. I'm super psyched. In fact, I was texting Bavia, and I, I, who's the young lady that was on before, and I said, can we start it tomorrow? <laughs> Let's do it together. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that together. That's the key. It really goes a lot further when we have accountability and support. Thank you. This is great. So now for the questions and answers, um, if you're ready for that, we can start. We do have a few. I'd like to at least tell people that haven't been with us how they're supposed to submit their questions. So if you have a question or comment, you can ask it using the Q&A button in the app, which also allows you to send your questions if you'd like anonymously. Or you can just ask your questions live by raising your hand. To do so, click the raise hand button or just press the star nine if you're on a phone. I'll call on you and then of course you'll have to unmute yourself when I ask. So there we go, we have a few. We do have some comments and they're really great. So I wanna at least, there may not necessarily be questions but I'd like to at least let you know what they are. So um, Charlie said as a comment, um, thank you, Dr. Peyrovi, for doing this. It is good to see you have power back on and not forced to do a Zoom meet via flashlight. <laughs> I currently eat a meal a day and then skipping, or I skip eating the following day. In other words, eat every other day. And my ingredients vary under the sun with a limitation on carbs. I must admit the carbs can be tough as I love macaroni. Anyway, thanks again. So that was... I love that. that. One. Yep. And then Lindsay says, I've been a vegetarian since I was 12 years old and I eat a lot of fake meat products. Like I, I've never heard of this and I'm a vegetarian, so I've never heard of this, um, but it, it's IVES, I believe, et cetera. Okay. I know that they're processed, but are they good for you? And if not, what should I eat for protein? Such a good question, Lindsay. So, um, oh, what happened? The question went away. Uh, okay. I remember, I remember what it was. Okay. So I am highly against, um, any processed foods. I think, you know, we've sort of marketed to people to think that, well, it's, it's soy and now it's tofurkey, but it's soy, it's a plant. It's okay. Well, I want you to turn the ingredient label over and look at the ingredients and there's probably going to be 20 or 30 ingredients. And most of them you can't pronounce. So for that reason, I think you're always better off staying away from the processed foods, but there are actually lots of great um, protein sources for people who are ve vegan or vegetarian. So for example, Nuts and seeds are wonderful. And when you eat these more dense sources of protein, like you add them onto a salad, you stay fuller longer. Um, beans and legumes can be helpful. I know there are doctors online that are talking about like no beans ever, never. I don't know. I have a more middle of the road approach. You know, you, you can test out whether foods are making you, you know, or that you're sensitive to um, and you can avoid them. But otherwise, um, you know, beans and legumes can be a really important source of um, protein for a lot of people who are plant based. Um, tofu, as long as it's organic and non GMO, can be a good source. Um, and those are some of the ones that I'm thinking of now. Quinoa uh, can also be useful. So, um, and also if you're a vegetarian, but you eat, eggs and dairy, you know, those can also be um, sources of protein as well. Thank you. Um, Margie said, do you find, and I, I believe this is Kigong, 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 Kigong um, helps MSers. And is it going, um, I do Kai, Kigong, right? Kigong, Kigong. You got it. <laughs> yes. And no other MSers that do, we find it helpful. So do you have an opinion on that? Um, I do. Well, Qigong is an Eastern form of movement and meditation even. And Qigong is wonderful because it actually sort of follows the meridians that we use in acupuncture. So I think it's a wonderful way of starting to move the energy or chi around in the body. And I know that sounds very strange coming from a Western medicine doctor, but I do believe that there's energy that permeates through us. And I, I say that because I've just seen it in practice when I've performed acupuncture on people. So, um, you know, and here's the funny thing about your question, you know, if there wasn't a lot of literature backing Qigong for MS, should I tell you not to do it? Be even though you like it? 
there's really no um, side effects to it. There are actually studies that support um, Qigong for, for MS and so many other conditions because it's a mind-body practice. You're connecting the mind and the body and the, the nervous system calms down and the immune system calms down. So 1000% keep doing your Qigong. And there's a lot of um, uh, free uh, Qigong on YouTube even. Wonderful. Okay. So someone's asking, is there any benefit to drinking distilled water? Um, I don't know that there's any benefit. Um, I don't know a lot about distilled water, I guess. I just, I don't think that <laughs> it's something that you have to do when it comes to water. I like reverse osmosis water. I want you to remove the contaminants out of your tap water. I don't want you to go get bottled water because that's sitting in plastic with tons of chemicals. But if you can um, re uh, do reverse osmosis of your own tap water, that's the best you can do. And you can add a remineralization filter back on to pull, put some of the nutrients back in, uh, minerals back in. I have one comment on that. Um, we've had a reverse osmosis system for the last 32 years. And when we moved from one, it's expensive. And when we moved from one house to the next, it's actually removable and we just brought it to the next house. So you make the investment, it's sort of a lifetime investment. You never have to really buy a new one. So it's really great. And um, there are some really affordable ones now between two to $400. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So Karen's asking, um, if you fast more than 20 hours, do you lose muscle? Well, I think that depends on what you're doing the other four hours. You know, uh, I think if you're consuming enough protein, you're working your body, you're, you're exercising. Um, I, I don't believe that that's going to lead to significant muscle loss because then you come out of your fast and then you move. So, so um, I, I, it's not something I would worry about. Let's see. Um, Susie said, how many days is the restricting fasting fast? Or is it, is this every day? Okay. Is that the, is that the, um, time restricted feeding the overnight fast? Okay. Well, let me just explain that one since, we, we, um, I'll just explain it. So the overnight fast where you stop eating early and then you delay breakfast a little bit and you 12 hours or more, um, that one, you don't have to do it every day. If you could do it four to five times a week that actually goes a long way. Um, and then if you were talking about the fat, I don't think she was talking about the fasting mimicking diet. Cause I explained that one. I think, I think she was talking about the first one. Okay. So now Sherelle wants to know, will there be a video replay copy of this? And yes, Sherelle, this is going to be up on YouTube for probably almost forever. So you're going to be able to read see this over and over again and you can share this with your friends and tell them about the link also so give us about a week to do that and that will be on there um let's see i showed up late and she just wanted to make sure she didn't miss anything so that was a good idea let's see we have somebody from facebook who's asking uh let's see teresa asked for digestion purposes does it matter what to eat first do some foods take longer to digest than others protein carbs are there foods that interact together that cause heartburn, upset stomach? Please explain how metab. This is a bunch of questions. <laughs> Please explain how metabolism works and why everyone's uh, can be different, fast or slow. So I don't know if you have access to see that, but if you'd like, I can start with the first one. Um, I can't see it, but I hopefully I'll remember it. Remember what you asked. Um, so I think a nice way of eating a meal is start with your greens and vegetables first. You want to fill up yourself with that and then go to your more denser proteins. Um, that way you kind of just trick yourself into getting the good stuff in first and hopefully you'll want less of the animal products maybe that you're eating. Um, also, I'll just say a word about water. Try not to drink like a big old glass of water right at the beginning of your meal because you're going to dilute your stomach acid and you just won't, you'll impair digestion. Um, what was the rest of the question? It's actually, you're, you're able to see it. Bobby said, you can see it. If you want to look, um, okay. it's in the chat. If you have chat. Oh, oh. You can... Okay. 
okay, do some foods take longer to digest? Yes. So things like proteins um, are harder to break down. Sometimes, you know, as people get older and their di digestion sort of, you know, isn't as robust, like when they eat a steak, like they'll be like, oh, it's just sitting in my stomach. So I, I do think those denser foods like proteins and animal products can take longer to get through. Um, are there foods that interact together that cause heartburn? Um, you know, the foods that contribute to heartburn are things like um, citrus, tomatoes, mint. Um, it can even be fermented foods, actually, for some spicy foods, greasy foods. Um, I don't know that it's the interaction between different foods that causes that, but certainly on their own, those foods can cause a lot of upset stomach. Um and, oh, and how does metabolism work? Oh, metabolism is really complicated, right? Because it's things happening at the biochemical level, it's hormones, it's our own activity levels. So for example, your thyroid actually drives so much of your metabolism based on what's going on in your environment. So let's say you were in a situation where you were in a famine, there's just not enough food. Your thyroid is going to shut down metabolism because there's not enough calories coming in. It's time to just sit down, rest, be tired and not move around and expend energy. Your, your um, uh, reproductive system is probably going to also shut down, right? With like really prolonged fasts or like when you don't have access to food, because it's not really a time to sustain a pregnancy, right? So your body has this like wisdom built into it. Um, so we can do things to increase our metabolism by moving more, um, you know, choosing foods that are simpler to um, digest and staying away from a lot of the processed packaged foods. Some of those foods tend to sort of get, um, you know, the food, the fats tend to get, um, instead of you burning them off as heat, you will, you know, save them and add them on to your fat cells. Okay, next one. Okay. So now Susie's asking if you could give some examples of fermented foods. Sure. So I feel like you can ferment just about anything. So vegetables can be fermented. So like cabbage becomes kimchi. Um, you can ferment like pickles can be fermented. A lot of times they're pickled, um, which means they don't have a lot of good living bugs in them. But you always want to look for the word for the word um, live active cultures when you're buying something. Um, let's see. Hmm. Kimchi, sauerkraut, um, well, yogurt, kefir, or kefir, however you say that word. Um, and then my personal favorite is kombucha, which is fermented tea, which is the only fun drink in our house. It's either water or kombucha. Um, so what, you, what you're doing with these foods is that you're replacing the good bugs back into your GI tract by consuming them. And I suggest that you get a couple of different ones. So you're just not eating kombucha every day or drinking. Um, you want to have variety because when we eat a lot of different foods and, and different fermented foods, our microbiome, those bugs become more diverse. A lot of different bugs grow and that's really useful. Thank you. So someone's asking in regards to fasting, how do you manage medications and supplements that need to be taken with food? I take my meds for, that's a great question. I take yeah. my meds first thing in the morning at 6 a.m. So I don't get sidetracked and forget. Great question. And you'll have to personalize this to what works for you. So if you have to take a medication that requires food and it has to be early in the morning, then you might have to break your fast and just honor that. I think it's important to take your medications as they're prescribed. Um, however, if the medication doesn't have to be taken with food, it's fine. You could take it with a small sip of water and not consider that breaking your fast. Um, same thing with medications at the end of the night. So if you want, if you need to take something at bedtime, and you're trying to have that three hour window before bed, um, you could just, um, uh, you know, take it with a small sip um, and that's fine. Okay. And Karen saying, if you have thoughts on keto, what about drinking keto? Okay. So keto, like as in a ketogenic diet, I have been on a ketogenic diet and it's the most amazing thing, but me personally, I couldn't do it for too long. Um, so what I actually do is I'm sort of just under ketosis. And the way you get into ketosis is you drop the carbs that you're consuming, maybe under a hundred grams a day. And what happens is your body switches from some, from, uh, <laughs> breaking down carbohydrates for energy to breaking down fat 
for energy. And so then you produce ketone bodies and your brain gets really well fueled. So guess what happens? Fatigue improves, anxiety and depression and pain improve, and your immune system's happier. So this is why keto ketogenic diets have been um, shown to be helpful for MS. Now, if you're drinking ketones, um, you're really kind of bypassing the whole system, right? You're better off like actually having the ketosis be generated from your own system. So you want to shift metabolism from breaking down carbs to breaking down fats for energy. Great. Okay. So now somebody's asking if you see a benefit to being gluten-free to help MS. I love this question because it comes up every single day in my life. Not everybody in the whole world needs to be gluten-free, but if you are sensitive to gluten, yeah, then you need to be off of gluten. How do you know if you need to do that? Well, we have blood tests, but they're not very accurate. So the best way to know is you cut out gluten 110% out of your diet for three to six weeks. See how that goes. Uh, and then at the end of that period, you reintroduce gluten back in for over 72 hours, eat a lot of it and see if you have a symptom that comes up. You can go from being not gluten sensitive to then sensitive. And then maybe when your gut heals up again and things feel better, you can maybe tolerate gluten again. But I think it's a, um, there's a large number of people with MS who react to many foods and the top two offending foods are gluten and dairy. So if you've never tried being gluten-free, I highly recommend you try. You know, do the three to six weeks and then reintroduce and then you decide if you need to pull it out or not. And then I just see the next question is um, dairy. And I will say the same thing I just said for gluten applies to dairy. Those are the top two most problematic foods that tend to kind of stir up the immune system. Deborah's asking if you can suggest foods to increase slow digestive motility. Foods to, so basically foods to make your gut move faster. Mm -hmm. Is that that's the question, right? Um, sure. Uh, well, let's see. Ginger is a pro-motility food. Um, rhubarb, flax seeds. Um, you know, if you If you actually go and look up pro motility foods, just, you know, you'll see a bunch of foods that are mainly um, plant-based foods that can be, can be utilized. Okay. Deborah's, um, I'm sorry, Deborah, we just did. Gina's asking, what fermented foods do you eat? Ah, <laughs> ah you're asking me a hard question. See if I'm doing, walking the talk uh, right now in my house, by the way, this is not my house. I'm at a neighbor's house. I still don't have power. Um, we have two giant vats of kombucha because that's what our family goes through. And it's dirt cheap when you make it yourself. Um, I have kimchi and I have fermented shallots that we made ourselves and they're delicious. Okay. Now Vincent's asking for examples of fermented food, but we just did that. So, uh, let's see, what is your take on multivitamins? Do they make MS better or worse? So if you have a well-rounded diet and your digestion is good, then you probably don't need a multivitamin, but for many people who struggle with what I just described, then yeah, you could take a multivitamin, a multivitamin, multimineral to help supplement. We don't really know how much of these nutrients in a vitamin capsule actually get absorbed, but you can try taking them. And a lot of people like doing it as a routine. It's not something that I often ask patients to do unless they want to. Okay. And Isabel has an interesting question. Is drinking alcohol okay? Organic wine, perhaps? I think in moderation, yes. And I like that you brought up organic wine because um, a lot of people say, well, I think it's a, it's good for you to drink two glasses of wine a night. You know, the studies show that it's good for heart health. And um, yeah, but so are like exercise and a bunch of other things that are good for heart health. But people always are like, I'm going to do the wine every night. So um, yes, in moderation, a few times a week is fine. But when it's like becomes habitual is when it's a problem. Okay, so Bridget's saying, I often see labels on probiotics that people who are mm -hmm. immunocompromised should avoid taking them. Does that apply to people on certain DMTs? If yes, why is it that, why is that? And does the same warning apply to fermented foods? 
Sure. I, I do see that on probiotics. Um, you would have to be quite immune suppressed to have to stay off of probiotic supplements. So like people who um, have multiple immune conditions, they're on steroids long-term. Those are people that I would be careful with um, to you know go and pick up a probiotic supplement. And this is why we always want to do a food first approach because it's just safer and it's more physiologic and it's just such a better fit for our bodies. So while I would say be careful with probiotic supplements, if you're immune compromised, um, I don't think the same warning applies to food. And if now let's say you're just on DMTs, it should be fine to take a probiotic. Okay. And before we go any further, because I know we're past our time and you were kind enough to say you would continue, but we don't want to overstay our stay with you. So oh, what have if, if you need to. Okay. So you tell us when you're ready to go. Okay. That sounds good. We'll go 10 more minutes. How's that? I don't know how many other questions there are. We'll see. And, it, and if not, you can always have people send their questions in afterwards and we can forward them to you. If you would be kind enough to answer them, we could always get back to people. So sure. um, let's see. I'd rather do them here. <laughs> okay. Good deal. Okay. Let's see. Um, hello. I was a, a vegan, but lost too much weight and depleted my iron stores. I am now on Swank in which I eat chicken and fish, I feel better. I also have NMO similar to MS. Great. Thanks, Kathy. That's a great question. You know, not everybody does well with a vegan diet and to do vegan, right? You got to like really work hard to make sure you're pulling in all the foods because B12 is hard to get with a vegan diet. So I like, I mean, if you're feeling better on an animal, on a little bit of animal products, like that's great. Then that's the right um, diet for you. I've tried being a vegan and all I can think about is eggs all day long. It's not for me. There are other people who thrive as vegans. So it's good that you listen to your body. Um, and uh, I forget, was there another question in there? No. Um, no, no, that okay. was it. Is, is milk an inflammatory drink? Okay. Uh, there's milk can cause different reactions. There's, um, uh, intol like milk intolerance or lactose intolerance, which is an enzyme problem. We lose the enzyme to break down lactose. Um, but a lot of people can start producing IgG antibodies to milk. And that's why I said, milk and dairy and, and gluten are the top two things that cause problems for, for people. So um, I would say if, if you're not sure, go ahead and test it out. Stay off of milk and dairy for three to six weeks and then reintroduce heavily over three days. That's really the gold standard of knowing if it's a, if it's a problem for you or not. Do you feel like stevia is a good sweetener option? Stevia comes from a plant. So it's actually one of the better sugars and, um, you know, used in small amounts. I think it's fine. Okay. Karen said that MS, she's had an MS diagnosis for the last four years. And up until a few months ago, she was a vegetarian. Lately, she's been craving beef, which she has added to her diet and she's feeling better. And is she doing the right thing? She wants to know. Yes, 100%. Listen to your body. Remember, I didn't on that plate, I said 20% or less could be animal products. So eat the foods that you're craving because our bodies have wisdom and they can tell when they need some nutrients. So you just listen to your body, but just follow the, the big the, the big principles that I talked about. And Nicole said I, she has an ulcer and it's causing her major discomfort. She wants to ask her doctor for an antibiotic. I don't know if she means antibiotic or probiotic, but what's your thoughts on introducing an antibiotic? Well, um, we'd have, I think it's always important if we're going to use an antibiotic that we know what we're treating rather than blindly handing out an antibiotic. So um, if you're, if there's maybe H. pylori, then yes, you would need an antibiotic to do that, to treat that. Um, what's but, you know, I think there are other ways also to deal with an ulcer. If you can work with a naturopathic doctor or an integrative medicine or functional medicine doctor, there are supplements that can be used that can help soothe some of that GI lining and help improve an ulcer. Um, and you might also need to be on acid blockers if the ulcer is still there. So um, also, you know, bone broth actually does a lot for for, um, you know, healing up the lining of the GI tract. So bone broth, if you eat animal products, there's something called magic mineral broth 
for those vegetarians out there who don't want to do bone broth. And, um, you know, I, I, that's, that's a good start, but you need to have a doctor look at that. Good, 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 good suggestions. Um, any advice on managing constipation? Uh, that's the topic of a whole nother uh, session, but I will say my quick and dirty for things for um, constipation is uh, move your body every day. So exercise, drink water, half your weight in, um, so take your weight in pounds and cut it in half. And that's how many ounces of water you take. So if you're 150 pounds, you should be drinking 75 ounces of water, um, up your fiber. You should be getting at least 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day. And if you're, most people are like a 10 or 15, if they're not paying attention to their diet, don't all of a sudden go to 25 or 30, you're going to feel really bad, gradually go up. Um, there are teas out there like smooth move tea that I think is really useful. Um, and then there are some supplements. You could talk to your doctor about magnesium. That's really useful. These are like my first line things that I do before we go to like an over-the-counter medication. I think most of the time you can get by with um, natural therapies for most people. And also probiotics as, as start adding the fermented foods in. Melissa is asking, what are some good examples of, examples of plant protein? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, nuts and seeds, beans, legumes, um, soy, quinoa. Um, and I think I'm blanking on that. Those are, those are some of the ones I just came up with. Yeah. And Nancy wants to know, she said, uh, her wife has already done the intermittent fasting. She's had the diabetic type two. Why when before take uh, breakfast, her blood sugar is high, about 110, and then after the breakfast, about 90. She already did the 16 hours of fasting. Uh, the 16 hours of fasting is going to sort of like help. Um, well, it's, it's just a little complicated because it kind of depends on so many other things. But, um, you know, fasting in the morning, it, it's not fasting by itself. Isn't going to cure your diabetes. Right. And so we, we like fasting sugars, like under a hundred, I like them closer to 85 for people who don't, you know, have diabetes, but, um, you know, it might have to do with the quality of the foods she's eating, or maybe her, um, you know, pancreas system is still not quite where it needs to be. So this might need to do with some medications needing to be moved around. Thank you. Um, do you have any any um, thoughts on dark chocolate, chocolate in general, dark chocolate, and how to break that habit? Is there something she can replace it with? No, don't break up with chocolate. Don't break up with dark chocolate. So if you have, okay, I, I mean, yeah, please don't do that. So Kathy, 75% um, or more cocoa content without a lot of sugar, and artificial ingredients, maybe go for organic and choose a brand that doesn't have heavy metals in it. Um, I can't come up with the brands. I was just reading an article on this a few days ago, but I don't have the brands memorized. I think one of them that's good is Cho, T-C-H-O. Um, and a, a square inch of chocolate, a dark chocolate a day is good for you. It actually, actually has a lot of antioxidants in it. Good. And I know somebody's asking about kombucha, but you've already mentioned that. So. Yes. And there is sugar in kombucha, but the sugar is not for you. The bacteria and the yeast in the, in the SCOBY are metabolizing that. That's their food. That's how they produce all of the organic acids. So we like to make our um, kombucha go more towards the vinegary side when we start pulling it off and drinking it. Interesting. Tom said that um, he's on Tech Bidera and it requires him to eat two times a day with his pill. And and he finds it easier to deal with the side effects by eating fatty foods, generally go to avocados. Um, he still has loads of gastrointestinal problems and finds it hard to balance alongside taking his meds. So he said he generally tries to eat a very healthy organic you know, diet, but still gets stomach problems. Any recommendations? Sure. Um, well, uh, if you, let's see, you said that you're still, you're able to eat fatty foods uh, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with plant-based fatty foods like coconut, avocado, olives, and their oils. 
because these good fats can actually be really good for us. Um, and just remember our brains and nervous system are made of fat. So you want to be putting the right fight kind of fat in. Um, if you are still having trouble with digestion, uh, I mean, there's lots of different things to think about, but one thing to maybe ask your doctor about is digestive enzymes. So if that, if you just need a little extra boost to break foods down, that might be helpful. Um, but again, maybe start adding in the fermented foods and doing a little bit of that fasting at night and going to bed with the empty stomach and see if that helps. Good advice. Uh, Siobhan said that she'd like to know if there's any advice for a person like her who has an allergy to fresh fruit and some vegetables. She can eat fresh uh, fruit and vegetables that are cooked, but it's not as healthy. Um, well, but you know, you could still eat them cooked. And I think that still goes a long way. And if you're like stewing a, a fruit, like you can even drink the, the, the liquid part, um, you know, and I think anytime you can avoid an allergic situation, that's, that's a good thing because I think of all of the different things that stir up the immune system as things like you don't want to keep doing, um, like, uh, getting exposed to maybe plants outside that stir up the immune system, like, you know, hay fever or, you know, eating foods that maybe you might be sensitive to that are like food reactions for you. So the more we can avoid them, the better. And I would say eat them the way that it makes sense. Um, now if, you know, you might want to investigate a little bit into why you have those, um, those, uh, allergies. If you've never worked with an allergist or a nutritionist, that might be useful to help figure out how to liberalize, liberalize and expand your diet. Okay. Marcy's asking, what are your thoughts on non-diabetic MS patients using glucose balancing meds like Wegovy and Ozempic to help with weight loss? Oh, okay. So you don't have diabetes, but you have MS and you want to lose weight. I'm generally not a fan of that approach. I just don't think that it long-term works. Um, sometimes I know that some of them, some of these are actually, you know, FDA approved, but I don't know. I just always kind of go for the less is more approach. And just remember by eating an early dinner over a year, um, a smaller dinner, three hours before bed, you'll lose five to 10% of your weight. And fasting is something that really changes your relationship to food and eating. So that might be something to do first, but if you were going to use those medications, obviously you're going to do it under the care of someone who understands them. But I just don't know that long-term that that's really the solution. Jen would like you to talk a little bit about, um, foods that can help with remyelination. Oh, I, I don't think I know a lot about that. Like, I don't know what data we have that says these foods increase remyelination. But if you think about myelin, there's a lot of fat in myelin. And I would say, you know, making sure you have enough, you know, good plant-based fats on board would be important. But I don't know of foods that actually, re, you know, uh, reliably help with remyelination. Okay. Are there any um, hemp or pea proteins that are okay? Uh, I always ask people why they want to do a protein powder, because it's not that hard actually to get protein from diet in, in a first world country. So, um, and the, just as a rough measure of how much protein you need, you take your weight, um, in pounds and you take a third of it. So if you're 150 pounds, the minimum protein you need every day is 50 grams. And you add maybe 20% to that as your upper limit. Most people have no trouble hitting that level if they're eating animal products. Um, now let's say there's a good reason why you need to supplement with a protein powder. Um, I would get an organic one. Um, I would get maybe, maybe, you know, if you're not sure if you might have trouble with dairy, stay away from the dairy based ones and go with a, a P P one. Okay. Kathy said that she's on the swink diet and she does, she does drink red wine in moderation. I do intermittent fasting 12 to 14 hours every night from 6 to 8 a.m. Um, then have my two cups of coffee before my green smoothie. Is lean meats okay as I used to be vegan, but it made my ferritin levels low? I'm now on IV rituxin every six months for my NMO. That's a beautiful regimen. 
Like everything you're doing there is right. And you can have your lean meats, you know, get high quality animal products, organic, grass fed. Uh, and, you know, yes, I know it's more expensive, but any kind of animal protein is expensive, right? So just limiting the number, but getting high quality stuff, I think is important. But again, yeah, when people go vegetarian or vegan, their iron levels can fall. And do you have any thoughts for Alfonso on the alkaline water? I have never figured out what alkaline water is and how it helps. I don't know. I think it might be some marketing <laughs> and trickery, but I, maybe I'm just not, maybe I'm just unaware, but again, I would just go with reverse osmosis water with a remineralization filter. It's the best you can do. Okay. And Charlie has a thought, something that he's often wondered. Possible question for a nutritionist. One makes a, one makes a veggie soup. Does cooking the veggies in the broth kill the minerals and vitamins or do they leach into the broth? Food for thought. <laughs> Yes. When you stew food or you make a soup, they leach into the broth. So it's a really nice way of preparing food. And Lynette would like to know, do you consider probiotic supplements to be beneficial? If so, what should I take for uh, in one? What should she look for in one? I, I think all of us can use probiotic support. My first line is go for food, right? And if, um, and try to get a little bit of fermented foods in every day. If you do want to do a probiotic supplement, you know, they tend to be expensive. They're about a dollar a pill. Look for um, a product that has at least six or eight strains of bacteria. And then um, uh, look for how many, how many billion colony forming units are there. So a pediatric dose would be 5 billion colony forming units. That's how much bacteria is in there. An adult dose would be like, I don't know, 20 to 30 or 40 billion colony forming units. And then high dose would be like over a hundred. So you could do that maybe for eight weeks just to see how it goes. And then if you want, if you want to continue, you could start tapering it down. You don't have to take it every day. Take it every once, one to three, uh, take it every three to five days, because whether we get our probiotics from food or a supplement, they kind of hang out in our gut for about three to five days. Okay. We have four in front of me. The, why don't we do the next four and then we'll stop. Is that okay with you? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So Barbara said, wait a minute. I feel like I've always been told to drink water before eating to help you feel full faster, but that actually works against your digestive system. And she's going, what? <laughs> You're I telling know. her one thing. So, you know, in traditional Chinese medicine and in Ayurvedic medicine, you know, these ancient forms of, of, of healing, they talk a lot about how do you sort of you know, optimize your body. And one of the, one of the reasons you don't want to drink a ton of water is that you dilute that stomach acid. So you want to have food drop into that low, low pH and start breaking it down. And if you're eating two to three healthy meals a day, um, just keep those meals small and, but make sure that they're, you know, nutrient dense foods and you don't have to trick yourself into feeling fuller faster. Okay. And Maya said, is there any chance to allow cheese into your diet? <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm with you, Maya. I recently became dairy sensitive and all I want to eat is cheese. I didn't even like cheese before. So um, if, if you have a dairy sensitivity, you know, if you don't know, test it out three to six weeks, no dairy, and then have a lot of dairy and see how it goes. Um, if you are sensitive, what I have people do is like, let's work on gut health, let's improve things and then see if you could tolerate it better. Because if we keep putting foods in that we're reacting to, we're just stirring up all the inflammation, right? And that's not good for the immune system or MS. Um, now some people can tolerate sheep's or goat's milk or dairy because the proteins are different than cow. And so if you've always had cow and your body's made, learn to make pro, make antibodies towards those proteins, you can switch to a different animal and see if that helps. And sometimes people, um, you know, will tolerate cheeses better than milk. So trial and error. We used to have pet goats in our house or in our barn. And because we had pet goats, I cannot drink goat cheese. I, uh, goat milk, I can't have goat cheese. They remind me of the goats, so I can't. But everyone loves it. Everyone loves it. 
Yeah. So, okay. Um, my functional doctor, Becky says, says, says nuts and seeds are covered in acid and to avoid them unless they've been soaked. Do you agree? I'm so excited to know that you have a functional medicine doctor. I think it really helps to have another provider on the team that has a different lens, right? And we all kind of work together. Um, so nuts and seeds, you know, can have phytic acid um, and lectins that can be um, like, they can kind of bind up nutrients in the gut and like may help you prevent you from absorbing them. Um, yes. Um, from uh, soaking them definitely does help. In fact, I love um, soaking beans and legumes at home because what happens is they soften and then you could just eat them raw in a salad or you could saute them. You don't really have to cook them anymore. So, um, you know, if you think you're sensitive to nuts um, and seeds, then do the experiment of three, three to six weeks off and then reintroduce them, but then um, soaking them and sprouting them can be really helpful. Okay, this will be our last question. And okay, so this one is, can I use various vinegars? This is a great question as options for fermentation. Please yes. tell us. Vinegar is another fermented food. So it should be part of what you do at, well, you know, sometimes I make a fancy drink at home with sparkling water, vinegar, little, little, you know, mint, drop of stevia. And then I feel like I have a cocktail. Nice. <laughs> Nice, nice. So I'm going to encourage everyone, since Dr. Perovi has agreed to come back again, um, the, all those people that we did not get to your questions, I'm sorry, but I would suggest bringing them with next time when you come to see us. Okay, um, so that is the end. And let's, let's say it's the end of our time for tonight. Thank you so much for staying longer than we even agreed to before. That was very kind of you. If you missed any part of this conference, it'll, it has been recorded, as I said, and it'll be playable on our Facebook and also on our YouTube channels. Please reply to your registration email for information on how to access recordings or sign up for our newsletter to learn about upcoming events. Also, very importantly, you're gonna be getting at the end of this a very short survey. And I try to beg everyone to please take those couple minutes and do it because that's how we determine what's most meaningful to you and what you wanna hear again, what you're looking forward to in future education. So just take that couple seconds. It really helps us determine what we're gonna put out there for you. So our next teleconference is gonna be this coming Tuesday, January 17th. It's at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. Our speaker is Dr. Aaron Boster, and he's gonna be doing what he does every other month for us, which is a Q&A. And you can come with as many questions and any kind of question you have related to MS and he will answer it. <laughs> so please do that. We have a whole hour with him for that. That's gonna be um, again, Tuesday at 6.30 PM Eastern. So we actually call that Ask the MS Expert. So our sincere thanks to everyone that's attended today, especially to Dr. Peyrovi, who took her time out of her busy schedule with no electric to come here and get on at her neighbor's house. <laughs> Is that really where you are at your neighbor's house? Yeah, very nice. And to sh share all this really super important information with us. I appreciate everyone. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we shut down tonight, Dr. Peyroi? I think I'll say, based on what you heard today, put that one thing into practice. That's how we start. Good, good advice. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you again. Have a great